I think there's a special today, but I could be wrong. Wrong? Okay, all right. If you want me to preach shorter, you know, that's how you get it to happen. So, fair enough. All right, Genesis chapter 37, if you'll turn there. We've been talking mostly about Jacob for the past, I don't know, a couple months even, uh, maybe a month and a half. And uh, we're, we're getting to this point where we're transitioning from the story of Jacob to the story of his sons. Jacob is what's, he's known as a patriarch, okay? Uh, the Bible would identify roughly four or five patriarchs. You know, you could sort of call Noah a patriarch, but really Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and then perhaps Moses could be considered the patriarchs, which is the fathers of our faith. So if you ever hear the word the patriarchs mentioned in scripture, it's talking about these guys that we're looking at in Genesis. So turn to Genesis chapter 37. Joseph is the really, he's the final major character in the book of Genesis. So in what has taken us, oh, I've been here almost four months now. We've started at the very beginning and we're almost through the first book of the Bible. There are still 65 other ones to go. So don't worry, there'll be plenty of preaching material. You know, you won't hear a repeat scripture for a little while. Uh, I'm joking around a little bit, but I hope you've already seen, and as you'll continue to see, the pattern that shows up in scripture. God will call out to a person or to a people and they will turn from their former way of life and begin to follow him. And he will save them and he will start to change them. However, what we see through Genesis and we'll continue to see is that the change is never fully good enough. That even in the midst of all the grace that he pours out and the changes he makes, There's still sin. It keeps popping up. It keeps coming up. No matter what seems to happen, what God seems to do to call people out, this problem of sin persists on. And what's the point of us seeing that in the scripture? Well, that shows us that all of what God had done wasn't his, uh, what's even the pinnacle of what he was trying to do until we get to Jesus. Because from the moment of Jesus on, we can see this true lasting victory over sin. When you look at the book of Acts, there are a couple of shortcomings that the apostles run into, but you see a completely different pattern in the New Testament than you see in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, that you know, they'll keep going and keep going, but oh, they just they just keep messing it up. In the New Testament, the apostles, they really seem to live a life of victory. And so we can see that all of these stories, what I want to make sure you get, because we're laying the foundation here. That's all we can do. We're laying the foundation. All of these patriarchs in the Old Testament were all leading up to Jesus. They were all meant to show us our need for a Savior. Amen? That's the purpose. We can see the stories. We can see all their shortcomings. We can see all the mistakes they made. And that showed that like they were trying to live righteously, but they just didn't have it yet. We can try our whole lives to do things the right way by ourselves, and we just don't have it. We need Jesus to live righteously. You can be the best person you can be on this world and still be unrighteous in the sight of God. You need a Savior. His name is Jesus. All right? That's what I wanted you to see so far, and we'll continue to look at these stories. But as I said, we're transitioning from Jacob to Joseph. Let's pray as we do that. Dear Heavenly Father, your word is so beautiful, it's so pure, it's so good. Dear God, I ask that you make us holy by your word, that you teach us and you reveal your Son to us through it, Lord, that you transform us by renewing our minds, that we might walk in righteousness and newness of life. I ask in the great and mighty name of Jesus, amen. All right, so we can see in verse 1, it says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age... Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. So we can see a transition here. It starts by talking about Jacob, but then it transitions to speaking about a man by the name of Joseph. Joseph was 17 years old at this point. He was a teenager. And the first piece of information we get about him, well, we get a couple pieces of information about him, but we get that he is, you know, He's, well, let's read two more verses, then we'll talk about that. It says, now Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons 
because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a robe of many colors for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. So in these first four verses, what do we know about Joseph? He's Jacob's favorite. He's willing to report on his brothers to his, fathers when, when, to his father when they do something wrong. And his brothers hate him for both number one and number two on that. Okay? You can get a picture in your mind of who Joseph is already just from that little bit of information. Joseph is that goody two-shoes. He's his dad's favorite. His dad loves him. And if you do something wrong, he's going to call you out on it, right? Anyone have a younger sibling like that? Don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. I was that young, younger sibling, actually. My, my sister would get angry at me because I was a tattletale. I would rat her out if she did anything wrong. I mean, that's just who I was. You can, and even if you didn't have that younger sibling or if you were even an only child, you can see this character in your mind pretty easily. Do you think God looked down on Joseph for those things? No. 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 It's amazing. You know, it's, it's kind of funny how we respond to people calling us out when we do wrong. Just in general, right? You can think, I mean, you can relate to me on this. When someone calls me out when I am in the wrong, just on anything, it can be something really small or something really big, my initial human response is not to consider what they've said. My initial human response is to get angry at them for it, right? It's amazing how that works, but that's, that's something that I believe is common in all of our human nature, what we'd call our sinful nature, because we never want to think that we are wrong, even when we are, right? That's why God sends us a spouse. Just kidding. <laughs> Among many other reasons, it, it, it's a sanctifying agent. It helps make us holy, because we can go through our whole lives and not notice when we do something wrong, but if you have a wife, you notice whether she tells you or not. I don't want to criticize my wife. She's wonderful. I, I just really should just not mention you. I get myself in trouble so much when I do. But no, I realize so much more of the things that I'm doing because if I'm just affecting myself with what I do, I don't notice. But if I'm affecting her with what I do, I start to notice. So that's why I'm saying that. I did not want to put myself in doghouse any more than I already have. But anyways, so Joseph, he was a tattletale on his brothers. But it was good that he was. His brothers were watching his father's flock. And so when they would do something wrong, when they would slack off, Joseph would report on them to his, his uh, father. I would likewise do this with my friends. You know, it didn't endear me to my friends, but my friends would have girlfriends from time to time. And if they were not being faithful in their communication, if they were flirting with other girls, and then their girlfriend would ask me about that, I would not cover for my friends. I would say, no, he was talking to this person. He shouldn't have been. And my friends did not like that. Do you think God reprimanded me for that? Oh, well, you got to be loyal. Well, who are you loyal to? Joseph was loyal to his father, and he was loyal to the truth. If you have loyalty to the truth, beautiful things start to happen. Okay? Loyalty to the truth is more important than loyalty to any person, even. Because think of, you know, I'm, I'm sort of getting off topic, but... It's part of scripture when Peter and Paul, Paul and Peter both knew the truth about the Jews and the Gentiles, that the Gentiles were saved just as the Jews were. But when certain men would come around, Peter would all of a sudden stop associating with the Gentiles and only sit with the Jewish people. Paul was not saying, well, that Peter, he's a really good man though. He's an apostle. I shouldn't say anything to him. No, Paul was loyal to God. And he said, Peter, you're being a hypocrite when you're doing that. He wasn't afraid to confront him on it. Joseph, likewise, was not afraid to confront his brothers and report on them to his father when they were doing wrong. But of course they hated him for it. That makes sense, doesn't it? It really, I mean, it makes sense in our, in our minds, but in reality, it shouldn't make sense to us. We should never get angry at someone for being righteous, but we do because it's in our human nature. But anyway, so his brothers, they hated him for this. Let's make that hatred grow a little bit. Verse five through seven, then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers that hated him even more, he said to them, listen to this dream I had. There we were binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly my sheaf stood up and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. So not only is he his father's favorite, and he reports on them when they do wrong to his father, but he also had this dream that he's going to basically rule over all of them. 
And that made them hate him all the more. Are you really going to reign over us? His brothers asked him. Are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Joseph is this, I mean, really, we can call him a goody two-shoes, but Joseph is a righteous man to this point. We haven't seen any examples of Joseph doing anything sinful, but who wants their little brother to rule over them? You know, it's, it's, once again, it's very easy to see why his brothers didn't like him, even though they were wrong. Am I making sense? I mean, it's easy to see. It's easy for us to relate to, right? You can, you can very clearly see why his brothers didn't like him. Yeah? Okay, let's take it one step further even. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Now, the 11 stars, that could be his 11 brothers, but who would the sun and moon be in this picture? His mom and dad. Oh, okay. He told his father and brothers, but his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you have had, he said. Are your mother and your brothers and I going to come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So his father was even willing to rebuke him because not only in his dream is Joseph saying that he's going to rule over his brothers, but Joseph was even going to rule over his father and mother. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Now, did Joseph give himself these dreams? No, they were given by God, so that's where we get that last phrase there. His, his brother was jealous, but his father kept the matter in mind. Where else do we see a similar phrase to that? Can anybody think of an example in the Bible? Mary. Mary. Yeah, exactly. Because she was told all these things about her future son, and it said she treasured these things in her heart. She just kept them, you know, just to... She, she remembered them for later. Likewise, you know... Jacob remembers, he, he just keeps this in mind. He makes a little mental note of it. Sometimes significant things will happen to you in your life and you'll just make a little bookmark of it just to keep that in mind for later. His brothers, on the other hand, they were just angry. They were clearly not fans of Joseph at this point. And what we have to understand, part of this is actually also a negative result of polygamy. I've told you there are multiple examples of polygamy in the Bible, but part of the reason there was this jealousy and this rivalry is because these, these sons, a lot of them were half-brothers. If we go back to the first verse, uh, it was, he was working with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. Those were the, the servants that were given as concubines to Jacob. Those were Rachel and Leah's servants. Uh, Joseph was the son of Rachel, who was the wife that... Jacob loved the most, right? So there would naturally already be some jealousy. So even though, as I've told you, the Bible has plenty of examples of men marrying multiple women, it never presents it as a good thing, okay? That's part of why they were so jealous and willing to do exactly what they're going to do here in this story. But they hated him. Jake, or Joseph only had one brother also by the same mother. Anybody remember who he is? Benjamin, and that's going to come into play later in the story about Joseph. But just keep those things in mind. Okay, verse 12 and 13. His brothers had gone to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. Where, now, have we heard Shechem before? That's where they had lived at, right? So they moved away, and they actually live about 50 miles from Shechem now, but they had still taken the flocks up there to pasture. Okay? Israel said to Joseph, your brothers, you know, are pasturing the flocks at Shechem. Get ready. I'm sending you to them. I'm ready, Joseph replied. You know, typically when you see that in Scripture, you know, the first couple times I read that, I'm like, well, why is that even in there? It seems sort of plain or redundant. But you have to understand, this was a 50-mile journey, and he didn't have a car. It would have taken a considerable amount of time for him to find his brothers, right? So he had to prepare for the trip. It wasn't, well, let's walk across the field and go find your brothers. No, he was traveling 50 miles to go see his brothers. So he prepared himself. Then Israel said to him, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are doing and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Why did Jacob send Joseph? Because Jacob knew that Joseph would report honestly what was going on. If they were doing what they were supposed to be doing or if they were doing something other than what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, let's see, do we read that? Okay, yeah. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He went to Shechem. A man found him there wandering in the field and asked him, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph said. Can you tell me where they are pasturing their flocks? 
They moved on from here, the man said. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph set out after his brothers and found them at Dothan. That would have been another 15 miles further than he had already went. So does that teach you anything about Joseph? Is Joseph a good servant of his father? Absolutely. Do you think Joseph knows his brothers hate him at this point? Yeah, if your siblings don't like you, you can get a pretty good idea of that pretty, uh, pretty easily. But he's still going to do that, even knowing his brothers aren't his biggest fan. They, being his brothers, saw him in the distance, and before he had reached them, they plotted to kill him. Imagine, let's just pause there. Imagine. Imagine hating your own flesh and blood so much that they are literally plotting to kill him. Now, I know it might not be a stretch for some of us to think, you know, I'm sure some of you have told your siblings, I'm going to kill you, right? But they were literally plotting to kill their brother. They said to one another, here comes that dreamer. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Let's talk about a couple more things there. What's, what's the only other... Well, we've had two examples of... of Already in Genesis, people either killing or talking about killing their brothers. Who are those two examples? Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Okay. What's the other one? He didn't actually end up doing it. But Esau talked about killing Jacob. Was Cain the child of prom- Was Cain the uh, one who the promise went down through? No, Seth was, right? Okay. Was Esau the one that the promise continued on through? No, okay. So we see, though, who are they following after when they are plotting murder like this in their heart? After Cain and after, ultimately, Satan. Okay, that we can see this clear pattern because there was a prophecy already in Genesis chapter 3 made to the serpent that you will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. Okay, Joseph was going to be the one who is actually going to be the savior of his people here. But the enemy is always trying to stomp out the righteous one early, early, as fast as he can. He's trying to destroy the seed, basically. So the enemy is actually working through Joseph's brothers here to try to kill him. If only his brothers would have known what Joseph would later do for them, they never would have done this. But they hate him so much at this point that they are willing to kill him. Now, I I shouldn't open up a can of worms here, but... Speaking of my wife again, I, I shouldn't do that. I, I'm going to do it anyways, though. I've already... Uh, when you were a young kid, there were probably times that you wanted to kill your siblings, right? I mean, maybe not literally, but there were times you were very angry at your siblings, yes? You don't have to admit it out loud. I can tell you, I'm sure there were. Uh, however... The longer you see them grow up, one of the reasons we were excited to move back here is so that Kelsey could have a relationship with her siblings. Now, when she was a kid, she probably didn't want to be around them all the time. There were times that they probably really got on her nerves, but now I can see her light up when her siblings are around. I'm sorry, that should be the last time I embarrass you today. But, but you can see that because so often, early on, you won't see why someone is there. But if you wait a little bit, you see it and then you can really enjoy your siblings. And, you know, my sister and I, we didn't always have the great, I'll embarrass myself. We didn't always have the greatest relationship. But then as soon as she moved out of the house, all of a sudden things improved. It's amazing what happens when you don't have to live under the same roof, right? So those of you who still have siblings and you're still living together and you get frustrated with each other, give it time. Just give it a little bit of time. I promise you things are easier when you're not coming after the same resources under the same roof all the time. I promise it does get easier, okay? Now that I've effectively put myself in the doghouse, let's continue on. So they plotted to kill him. They say, let's see what becomes of his dreams. They knew the dreams he had and they hated him so much they were ready to kill him. But then Reuben, Reuben was the very firstborn. So he was the one who was sort of in charge. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them. He said, let's not take his life. Reuben also said to them, Don't shed blood. Throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, intending to rescue him from their hands and return him to his father. Why do you think Reuben was the one showing concern for Joseph here? Why? He's the oldest. Do you think Reuben hated Joseph as well? Probably. 
But who would Jacob hold accountable if something happened to Joseph? Reuben, because he's the oldest. So Reuben's saying, no, 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 let's not kill him. That's not a good idea. Because he knew he would have to answer to his father for that. So, but let's just throw him into the pit. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off his robe, the robe of many colors that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. Let's pause there. So they, they see him, they take his coat off, you know, they pick on him, they throw him in the pit. And then they are so unconcerned with him that they stop to eat lunch. Think about what they're going to do next. Understand how much hatred they had towards their brother at this point. They were willing to kill him, first of all, but their oldest brother convinced him, well, let's not kill him. That's too much of a mess. Let's just throw him in the pit because we're mad and we hate him. Let's do that, but let's not kill him. And then they do that. They get a little bit of the anger out of the system and they go eat lunch. They don't care about their brother. They want him to die. But then they looked up. There was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam, and resin going down to Egypt. Now, there are a couple of interesting things about this. First of all, who are the people coming from Gilead? Ishmaelites. They wouldn't have been Muslims at this point because that, that wouldn't happen until about 1000 AD. But, but they would have been people we would have considered Arabs. Uh, but they were actually distant relatives of Jacob and the, the boys here and Joseph. They're actually distant relatives. It's interesting how that, you know, how that came about because we're only, what, three generations? Because Isaac, Isaac and Ishmael, and then, you know, Isaac had Jacob. So yeah, we're only on the third generation, but they're already far enough from their family. It shows that whenever Abraham said to send the slave woman and go, they didn't really keep in contact very much. Uh, but the Ishmaelites were coming and they're heading down to Egypt. And then an idea gets born here. Then Judah said to his brothers, what do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. It's basically saying, well, we shouldn't kill him, I guess. Let's just, you know, sell him instead. And they agreed. When Midianite traders, they're also, the Ishmaelites are also called Midianites, traders passed by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph to Egypt. So instead of killing their brother, they agree to sell him into slavery to the Ishmaelites, because this eliminates their problem without them having to shed blood. Now, I know many of you, I mean, if you were raised through children's church, you already know the end of Joseph's story, right? I'm sure this isn't a new story to just about anyone in here. But at this moment in the story, if you are Joseph, what are you thinking? What in the world is going on, right? You, you went from being your father's favorite son. You, he gave you this coat of many colors that was just to show, you know, how loved you were. You were doing things the right way. You were walking in righteousness. And instead of being rewarded for it, your brother stripped you of your robe, threw you in a pit, and sold you into slavery. Is that fair? No. What we're going to find, because this is the introduction in Joseph, and don't worry, this is actually, you know, I, I put myself in the doghouse with you guys for this one. I say, this is, should be a short sermon. We're already almost finished. Because I wanted this to serve as an introduction. But what I want you to see here, knowing what's going to happen, knowing that God set things up so that this would happen. It doesn't seem like it right now. All you see right now is injustice. All you see right now is difficulty and a trial. But if this never happened, if this never happened, the rest of Joseph's story never would have happened. Absolutely. If... You, so, so what we have to do is we have to take this and we have to use this on our own difficult circumstances. This is what I really want you to see this morning. Oftentimes when we go through difficulty, it's woe is me. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? This shouldn't be happening. What did I do wrong? Joseph had done nothing wrong. And yet within a day, 
He lost his position in his family. He lost his freedom. He, he was sent as a slave to a foreign land he had never been to. It was not his fault. He did not do anything wrong. But God is going to use him for his glory and for his family's good, even in the midst of all of this. Let's continue in the story and finish up this chapter. Say, so when Reuben returned to the pit, so Reuben clearly wasn't there when they decided to sell him. It says, when Reuben returned to the pit and saw Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy is gone. What am I going to do? So they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a young goat, and dipped the robe in its blood. They sent the robe of many colors to their father and said, we found this. Examine it. Is it your son's robe or not? So they came up with a plan to, you know, lie to their dad. His father recognized it. It is my son's robe, he said. A vicious animal has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said. I will go down to Sheol, which is the place of the dead, to my son, mourning. And his father wept for him. Understand, we have the benefit of being able to see the whole story. Jacob, when he was going through this, did not have that benefit. This is the last thing that Jacob will hear about his son until the miracle at the very, very end of Joseph's story. So sometimes we might think, oh, these people in the Bible, they had it easier. God came and directly spoke to them on this. How many years do you think it was before Jacob knew his son was even still alive? How many years? He refused to be comforted because tragedy was the last part that he saw. Even though it was a lie, it was a lie that he couldn't know that it was a lie. That was his son's robe. Notice also one last thing, the callousness of his brothers. They don't say, we found this, examine it, is it our brother's robe? No, it's, is it your son's robe? They don't even want to claim him as their own brother. And they were willing to lie and let their father think that their little brother is dead. But know this, these very people are the people who the very tribes of Israel are named after. We must understand the grace of God and the the divine foreknowledge of God and the blessings of God. Do you think that, that Joseph's brothers deserved the grace they were given? No, but that's grace. Do you think that we deserve the grace that we're given? No, but that's grace. What we have to understand is that mankind from the moment that we fell into sin, was so inherently corrupted, was so inherently sinful, that no matter what they tried to do, sin is what kept coming out. It's a sad thing. Think of your own life before Jesus. Think of when you've tried to do good, and yet sin still finds a way out. Does that ever happen? Hey, it's a sad and frustrating thing. Even when Jacob tried to do good, that when Jacob worked for his uncle for seven years, trying to do good to, to get the wife Rachel, what did his uncle do? His uncle deceives him. Oh, you did all this good work. Here's Leah. Work more for me for Rachel. Oh, well, now I have to be a polygamist. You know, now I have to take two wives. They, he was trying to do good and wrong was happening. Joseph was trying to do good and his brothers betrayed him. But... Thanks be to God, this isn't the end of the story. The last verse in this chapter says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guard. So the, this chapter of this story ends with Joseph being a slave in Egypt. Even though he was trying to do everything the right way, if that were the end of Joseph's story altogether, it would be a very sorrowful story. But we know that Joseph is actually going to be the savior of his family and is going to point us forward to the very savior of the world, who is Jesus, amen? But let's look at the similarity there in, in closing. Because Jesus, likewise, was completely righteous, amen? He came in and he lived a perfect life. And what did the Pharisees hate him for? Because he called them out in their hypocrisy. 
He was willing to tell them when they, he had a loyalty to the truth. And even though he should have been their brother and they should have loved him and accepted him and treated him well, at the time of their visitation, when Jesus came down to earth and ministered to them, they treated him with hatred. And Judas Iscariot sold him into slavery, so to speak, because they paid him 30 pieces of silver, which was the price for an adult male slave. Joseph was a young man, and so a young male slave would go for 20 pieces of silver, but an adult would go for 30. But likewise, they sold him into slavery. They sold Jesus to the Romans, basically, well, to the Sanhedrin, who later turned him over to the Romans, for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus died the death of a criminal. And likewise, if that was the end of his story, it would be a very sorrowful story. But just as we're going to see with Joseph, we can see with Jesus. The death was not his end, was it? And although he died a criminal's death, he was not a criminal, and he rose from the dead, and he would later be, and is, he is now, and will be, the Savior of all who believe in him. So what I want you to see as we continue throughout the story of Joseph is look at the typology of it. I mentioned it a lot early on in preaching, and I mentioned it a lot through this story, that Joseph is supposed to show us what to look for in a savior because he was righteous, and we don't hear him even complaining about his estate. I'm not saying he didn't, but we don't see any words of Joseph where he said, no, this isn't fair, what are you doing? No. He accepted it, he went and he became a slave. And you're going to find he was actually a really good slave. And he kept getting promoted and promoted because he was righteous, okay? But I want you to see the similarity to Jesus and Joseph. Because all of these Old Testament stories, the whole purpose of them is to point you to him. That's it. Because he is the only one who truly fixed the sin problem. Joseph is going to deliver his family from poverty. He's going to give them food in the time of drought. But Jesus is going to deliver from the very sin nature that destroys us. If you don't know that Jesus this morning, I promise you, he is everything that I say he is and even more. He is the greatest man to have ever walked the earth. He is God incarnate. He is God in the flesh who was willing to die a criminal death. Understand, he had infinite power infinite power, all the power of heaven, and could have easily at any point while they were torturing him said, nope, it's done, and turned it on them, right? Could he not have? Is he not God? Okay, he could have, and he chose to take it. He says, I lay my life down willingly. No one can take it from me. I lay it down, and I can take it back up again. Amen. He was willing to do that for you. He didn't die for his own sins. He died for our sins. So it really is as simple because I said, Jake, did Jacob start out righteous? No. no. Did Jacob do everything the right way? Did Isaac do everything the right way? No. Did Abraham do everything the right way? No. And yet God was willing to save them. God is willing to save each and every one of us. All he requires is faith. That's it. Trust him. Seriously, no matter how sinful you are, if you will simply go to him and say, God, I don't want to live this way anymore. I want to live your way. It is honestly as simple as that. Now, do you think it'll just end there and be like, okay, life's easy now? No, it'll be incredibly challenging. But there's a great difference. Without Christ, I'm solving all my problems myself and I'm facing everything alone. Ultimately, I might have my friends or family to help me with some things, but a lot of things you'll feel very alone in facing in this life. But with Christ, now I have someone to go to with literally anything and everything who literally knows the end from the beginning and can give you perfect, perfect advice at the perfect time. Amen? Have we not seen that in our lives? So I invite you, guys, if you're living for yourself, are you not tired of the effects of sin? Are you not tired of, no matter what good you try to do, getting in your own way? This is what led me to salvation. I was sick of the consequences of my own actions. I was sick of my own actions. I was sick of myself. And I needed a savior. You know, when, as I said, we've got plenty of Joseph's story to get through, but what ultimately had his brothers come to him? They didn't know it was him, but what had them come? Famine. Famine. 
They were hungry. They knew and they needed. The Bible says that in the last days, which I believe we're in the last days, amen? It said in the last days there will be a famine, not a famine for bread or for water, but a famine for the word of God. Guys, we live in a culture that you can, you can see it at most churches. You might read one or two verses in a, in a you know, service and then the sermon's not even over what those verses are over. They're just trying to give you some good advice for life, but it's all just a man's opinion. Guys, it's, that's no good for me. That's no good for any of us. This is what has what we need. This is why we go through the Old Testament. This is why we take the time. Because if you show me how you spend your time, I can tell you exactly what's important to you. You spend your time on things that are important to you. Your beliefs are what you end up doing. If you don't think this is important, I'm sorry. But this is so important. This is why, guys, and I'm, I'm going to be really annoying here. Not right now, but just over the course of time. Well, I might already be annoying to you, but you don't have to amen that. Uh, the church that I came out of, church that I came to from where I'm, when, when I moved and came here, we were to the point that we were meeting four nights a week on a lot of weeks. Now, I know that that doesn't fit everybody's schedule. That doesn't even fit our own schedule. And, you know, my job is literally the pastor, okay? I get that it's not always realistic for everybody to come to every single thing. But what I want you to get to the point of realizing is that the time we spend together is very precious and it's very valuable. And so I want to, over the course of time, give you more and more and more opportunities to come together. Don't feel obligated to come to all of them. I understand. You've got things you've got to do. I've got things I've got to do. You know, it, it, busyness is what it is. But value the things of God and look at what a difference it'll make in your life. I'm telling you, here's my challenge for you for this week. Spend five minutes in prayer. If, if you don't already, if you don't have a regular prayer life, just set yourself a few minutes per day. Say, I just want to make sure I go to God in prayer today. That's it. Every day. But be consistent with it. Watch what it does to your mindset for that day. Do it early in the morning. Early in the morning. Okay? Early in the morning. Because what it's going to do is it's going to set your mind. And the things in your day, the difficulties you come up with, it'll be amazing how much more able you are to handle them. Spend, read one chapter of one book of the Bible per day. Try it. Just try it. Like I said, don't just take my, try it out. See what it does for you. See if it, it's miraculous if whatever I'm going through in life, what I'm reading might not seem to even be about it, but all of a sudden, I'll have an answer for whatever I'm going through. God is spirit, and he works in spiritual things. But I'm telling you, if you will just do that, if you will just get to know this very savior of the world more and more, this life grows dim. This life, it's, I mean, there's a brightness that comes up, but it surpasses anything this world can have to offer. I promise you, this is, what, this is how I am to where I am today, which I'm by no means a finished product, but it was as simple as this. I started praying. I started reading the Bible. And life became so much more simple and so much more clear and so much more full of joy just because I simply started valuing the things that God values. It's, it's as simple as that, guys. I can't. I can't say it in any more elegant of a way. Follow Jesus. Be transformed. He can do what he says he can do. It's not just for some and not available for others. It's for whosoever will believe. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this story that we have here. Lord, I thank you that we already know the ending. For if we didn't, we would be very distraught by now. So for those who haven't heard it, before, oh God, I ask that you just comfort them and let them know that good will come out of this. For Lord, where we leave this story, it's, it's pretty rough. Jacob thinks his son is dead. Joseph is a slave. His brothers are liars and know they've lied to their father. And no one is really in a good estate. But dear God, you do not leave us in that estate, but you call us and work things for our good. For you are eternally and infinitely good. Dear God, please make us good. Transform us. Free us of sin, oh God. And glorify your name. Ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.